Welcome to this introduction to 3D Studio Max tutorial. My name is Kane Forrester and over the course of this video I'm going to be showing you how to change the UI scheme within Max along with an in-depth look at the file menu. Following this will be viewport manipulation and lastly we'll take a look at the basics of the main toolbar within the program. So let's get started. So once you've loaded the program, you should be greeted by a user interface that looks similar to this. Everything in 3D Studio Max is customizable to your own personal preferences. And the first thing I like to do is go to the Customize menu, click on Load Custom UI Scheme, navigate to the Autodesk 3D Studio Max folder, and then go inside the UI folder, and you should have five default themes to choose from. The one that you see in front of you is defaultui.ui, but I prefer to use the aim underscore light UI. So select it and click Open. Once the UI is finished loading, a warning box will appear saying that our settings will take effect next time we restart the program. Because we're just doing a graphical change to the UI, we can ignore this and click OK. So moving to the top of the program, we can see the very familiar looking Windows style menus, along with a 3D Studio Max icon in the top left hand corner. This is what Autodesk have used to replace the file button in recent versions of 3D Studio Max. Upon clicking the icon, you'll get access to all the standard options you'd expect to see within a file menu such as New, Reset, Open, Save As and hovering over any option that has an arrow next to it gives you context options to choose from within the menu. So in order to effectively use the file menu, we need to create something to actually save. So we're going to go over to the Create panel and select Teapot. There are a couple of approaches that you could use here. One is to just simply click and drag within a viewport and then use the parameters rollout on the command panel to change properties such as radius and segments. The other approach, if you want an extra level of accuracy, is to use the keyboard entry rollout, which allows you to manually set the radius of the object before creation. The X, Y and Z parameters are to do with the offset of the object relative to the world origin. So clicking create will create as a teapot with a radius of exactly 0.5 meters. So now that we've actually created a teapot, we can go ahead and save that by going to the file menu and save as. This will give us the save file as dialog where we can choose a destination for the file. At the very bottom you'll see that the save as type is 3D Studio Max. In 3D Studio Max 2012 it is possible to save files out that are compatible with the two previous versions of the program. This affords you the opportunity to work in the latest version of 3D Studio Max software while still being able to send your file to somebody that's using an older version of 3D Studio Max. But for now we're just going to use the 2012 format and give it a file name of teapot. Once we hit save, the file is saved and you'll notice at the very top of your screen it no longer says untitled, it now says the name of the file. Now regardless of your choice of 3D software, you'll find that it still has the possibility to crash on you. This makes saving iteratively incredibly important. So go to the file menu, click save as, and you'll be greeted again by the save file as dialog. After making sure that the file name is the same as what you've selected, you'll notice there's a plus icon next to the save button. Clicking on the plus icon will take the file name that you've chosen and enumerate it for you, creating an iterative save. You'll notice at the top of the program that the file name is no longer teapot.max, but teapot01. Now very often you will receive files that are not in .max format. To open these they will need to be imported. To do this, we go to the File menu, hover over the Import option, and select Import. Once the dialog appears, you'll have to navigate to the directory where the file is stored. 3D Studio Max has the ability to import most of the industry used file types. Clicking on All Formats will give you a list of these. You may notice that not all of the supported file types come from a 3D program. For example, Max can import vector graphics from Illustrator. But for now we're going to go with Objects, select the object file that we want to import and click on Open. So now we have the Object Import Options dialog, which allows us to change many different options which affects the way that Max processes the import. In this example I've made sure that Import a Single Mesh is unticked as to make sure that the spheres are separate objects after the import. If you're not sure which options to pick, you can select a preset from the bottom of the dialog which allows you to use the default settings for a number of different 3D software. 
but in this case we're going to use the default settings and just click import. Now as you can see 3D Studio Max has imported the four different spheres and they're all uniquely selectable objects. So now we've got our completed scene comprising of 3D Studio Max primitives and objects imported from a different program. We can export this if we wish. So we go to the file menu, select export, and you'll notice the export selected option is not available to you. This is because we haven't got any objects selected in the viewport. If you wish only to export part of or a single object within a scene, select them in the viewport before going to the file menu. But for now we'll click export. And this should bring us up a dialog which allows us to choose the file type we wish to export to. For this I'm going to use the Autodesk portable format FBX, give it a file name such as scene, and then click save. Upon first glance of the FBX export dialog, the multitude of options can be quite daunting. However, for this example we're simply going to use the default settings and hit OK. This then gives us a warning menu telling us that there are turned edges within the file and that the plugin cannot export the four spheres as editable poly objects and has to turn them into editable meshes. This is fine and we just click OK. So now that we've exported our file to FBX format we're going to pretend that we're loading 3D Studio Max on a different computer. To do this we're going to go to the file menu and hit reset. We don't need to save our changes because we've already just exported them and then we're going to have to click yes on the do you really want to reset dialog. This is in place to prevent any accidental deletion of work. Like before, when opening non-native file types we have to use the import menu, so we go to file, import, and then you can see on files of type we're set to object, so we need to either use all formats or FBX. Select the file and click open. Again, the import options can be quite daunting, but for now we'll just use the default and click OK. And as you can see we have our completed scene exactly how it was when we exported it. So to start off the viewport manipulation segment of the tutorial, we're going to firstly take a look at the view cube. The view cube is what you see in the top right hand of each viewport and it's a recent addition to 3D Studio Max. It allows you very quickly to switch between specific views of an object within a scene. As you can see, clicking the home button will take you back to its original position. To change the options for the view cube, the easiest way is to right click it and click configure. This will give you the viewport configuration window, which gives you access to all the options for the view cube. On ticking the show the view cube and hitting apply, we'll remove the view cube from the active viewport. The reason it still remains in the other three viewports is because they've not been selected as active. One of the easiest ways to bring the view cube back if you wish is to go to the views menu, hover over view cube, and select show the view cube. Alternatively you can hold Alt, Control and press V. If you don't want the view cube to be constantly visible but still have access to the functions it provides, one thing you can do is right click, go to configure and change its inactive opacity to 0%. Once you apply this the view cube will be invisible apart from when you hover your mouse over it. For now, I'm going to remove the view cube completely so that it does not cause a distraction. To do this, we can use the macro or we can go to views, view cube, and non tick show the view cube. So now that I've covered the view cube, we're going to go over the basic viewport manipulation techniques in 3D Studio Max. To change the layout of the viewports in 3D Studio Max, we first need to go back to the viewport configuration window, which can be accessed by right clicking any of the viewport icons in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Alternatively, we can go to the views menu and select viewport configuration. Once inside the dialog, we need to select layout from the tabs menu at the top. There are many different presets to choose from. I'm going to select one with the three orthographic views on the left and a large perspective window on the right. To change which particular view these boxes use, you can left click on any of the grey boxes which will give you a list of the available views. Once you've completed customising your viewport layout, click apply and click OK. We now have our large perspective window to work in while still having the three orthographic views top, front and left on the left hand side of our screen. 
Now a useful thing to do, especially if you're a games artist, is to have statistics enabled in your perspective viewport. To enable this, you can press 7 on your keyboard, which will show the statistics in the top left hand corner of the active viewport. To change the options for this, we need to go back to the viewport configuration dialog and select statistics from the tab menu at the top. Once here, you'll have a series of simple checkboxes to change in order to modify the appearance of the statistics within the viewport. Once you've finished customising the statistics setup, click apply and then OK. Now you can see that my statistics show that there are 492 triangles in the scene in total, along with 12 on the box that I've selected. By using the statistics window in this way, I am able to identify that there's 480 triangles in my cylinder and that it could be further optimised. To turn the statistics window off, just simply hit 7 on your keyboard again. Next we're going to look at two viewport modes that are heavily used whilst working with 3D Studio Max. Clicking on the realistic section will show that we're currently shading in realistic mode and there are many different options available to us. From this menu we're also able to modify how the viewport handles lighting along with materials and a whole host of other options. We're going to be looking at edged faces and wireframe, so I'm just going to select edged faces. With edged faces turned on, the viewport renders a geometric wireframe over the shaded objects. To turn edged faces off, simply hit F4. This is a toggle, so it can be used to turn the edged faces mode on and off. To switch into wireframe mode, we can use the menu at the top of the viewport, or we can use F3 as a toggle. Using F3 and F4 as toggles for these modes will help you speed up your workflow within 3D Studio Max. To toggle an object into transparency mode, you can use the hotkey Alt and X. This allows you to still work on the object whilst being able to see what's on the opposite side of it. Again, this is a toggle, so you simply have to use the hotkey twice to turn it on and off. Next, we're going to maximise the viewport. There are three different ways. You can use the plus in the top left hand corner of a viewport and select maximise viewport. You can also use the Alt and W hotkey, which is a toggle. Lastly, you could use the Maximize Viewport icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. All three ways do exactly the same job. To zoom in and out, we can use the zoom function in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. After selecting it, left click and hold in the viewport and move your mouse up or down to zoom in or out. Alternatively, we can scroll the middle mouse wheel, which does exactly the same job. Directly below the zoom icon is field of view. This will do the same as zooming in and out in a standard perspective camera, however it will also change the field of view property if looking through a camera. Adjacent to the zoom function is zoom all. To demonstrate this we need to come out of maximize mode and holding down left click in a viewport and dragging up or down will zoom all four viewports at the same time. Next to this is the zoom extent selected button which will change the camera to encompass whatever is selected, or in this case the entire scene, within a viewport. Next to this is the zoom extents button, which will do the same job as the previous button, but in all four viewports at the same time. To use the pan function, we simply left click within the viewport and drag. This can also be achieved by holding down your middle mouse button and dragging around the viewport. The arc function allows you to rotate a viewport in many different fashions, such as free rotate, vertical rotate and horizontal rotate. In order to achieve free rotate without using the arc function we can hold down the alt key and push down the middle mouse button. This will allow us to free rotate via a hotkey. So now I'm just going to maximize the viewport using our hotkey alt and w and then use the hotkey for zoom extents which is z. Hopefully by now you should be able to customise, navigate and manipulate viewports comfortably. So in this final section of the tutorial we're going to go over the commonly used features of the main toolbar by beginners. So this is going to cover Select and Link, Unlinking, Selecting Objects, Selecting Objects by Name, The Selection Region, 
move, rotate and scale along with grid snaps, angle snaps and percentage snaps. So at the moment we're in select and move mode which means if we select an object we'll get the move gizmo. If we want to select an object we can use the icon on the main toolbar, alternatively we can use the hotkey Q. This puts us into selection mode and you'll notice a visible change on the main toolbar. After selecting an object, its properties are available on the command panel on the right hand side of your screen. Now if we wanted to switch back to select and move, we could either click the icon or use the W hotkey. This will bring up the move gizmo which will allow us to move the object in the three different axes. At the moment we're moving the object on the Y axis to a control of three decimal points. To get the object back to its original position, I've used the undo hotkey which is control and Z. Alternatively, we could use the coordinate system at the bottom of the screen and right clicking a spinner will set it back to its default value of zero. If you want to have a greater level of control whilst moving objects, we can use the grid snap toggle. Selecting the snaps toggle will make the cursor snap to each point within the grid. When moving the object, the object will also snap to each point on the grid. You'll notice what we call a rubber band appear whilst moving the object. This allows you to visually assess how far the object has moved from its original location. You'll notice that we were easily able to move the object back to its original location without the need for secondary intervention. Next on the list is select and rotate. The hotkey for this is E. This will then display the rotate gizmo around the selected object, which allows you to rotate an object around the three major axes X, Y and Z. The grey circle around the main gizmo allows you to rotate an object based on your current view. Rotating an object whilst not using angle snaps allows us to rotate it to a degree of two decimal places. And to reset, I use the coordinate system at the bottom of the screen again. To rotate freely, we can click and drag within any part of the gizmo that isn't a major axis. To assess how much rotation has occurred with free rotate, we have to use the coordinate system at the bottom of the screen. So now I'm just about to turn on angle snaps which will allow us to rotate the objects more accurately. By default the angle snap is set to 5 degrees. If we wanted to change any of these options we can right click any of the snap icons at the top of the screen. This will display the grid and snap settings dialog box where all the options for grid and snap settings are stored. Under the options tab we're going to change the angle degree snap from 5 to 45 degrees. You'll notice that the three different types of snaps have three different measurements, pixels, degrees and percent. So for now we're going to change the angle to 45 and close out the window. You'll now notice that the object rotates 45 degrees at a time. So now I'll just turn the angle snaps off and the last one we're going to cover is the percentage snap. To demonstrate the percentage snap we're going to use scale. The hotkey for scale is R. With percentage snap turned off, we can freely scale the object on the Y, X and Z axis. You can see from the coordinate system at the bottom of the screen that the object is now 249% of its original height. Because we only modified the Z axis, the object is still its original width and length. To scale uniformly, we click and drag in the center of the gizmo. We can also scale on two axes at the same time by selecting any of the triangular parts of the gizmo. By enabling the percentage snap toggle button we should be able to scale more accurately. Right clicking the icon to bring up the options we can see that the percentage snap is set to 10%. If we set this to 100 the object will double in size while scaling. Because of the increase in snap we have to click and drag a lot further in order to scale the object. At the bottom of the screen we can see that it's now 200% of its original size on all three axes. Now I'm just going to go back to the options for the snap and grid settings and reset the percentage snap back to its original 5%. Now I'm going to cover the importance of select by name. You can see in the viewport that we've got a number of boxes. These are all uniquely named from box 001 to box 007. However, you might not be working in such a simplistic scene at one point and you might want to select a particular object and you only know the name of this object. Using select from scene will allow you to filter and search for the object that you're looking for. 
The filters at the top allow you to turn off certain types of objects in order to narrow down your search. If we wanted to select box 005 from a scene that was far more complicated than this, we could do this via the search function. We could select the object and click OK, and in the viewport the object is now selected. Next I'm going to go over linking objects in a hierarchy. For the purposes of this beginner tutorial I'm not going to go into hierarchy in detail. So say we wanted to link this green box to the pink box. All we do is select a link from the toolbar. And then click and drag from the green box to the pink box. To demonstrate another use for the select by name function I'm going to unlink the two objects. We've already established that the pink box is box 005, so if we wanted to link the green box to the pink box, we could use the select by name function, select box 005, and click link. This has now linked the two objects, and there is no margin for error. Now we have the objects in a hierarchy, we have a parent and child relationship between the two objects. Changes to the child object do not affect the parent, as we can see we've just rotated the child. However, if we were to rotate the pink box instead, the parent will affect the child and rotate it accordingly. So now that we know how select and link works, I'm going to go over different ways to select objects within a scene. To select both the pink and green box at the same time without selecting the center box, it's difficult to use the selection marquee. Instead, we can hold down the control button and click on the green box. This will allow us to select both the objects at the same time without selecting additional objects. There are a number of different selection regions available to you from the main toolbar. We're going to use circle and in order to demonstrate this more effectively I'm going to change the viewport to top. Now that we're in the top viewport I'm going to click and drag and you'll notice a circular selection growing within the viewport. Switching back to the perspective viewport, which can be achieved by using the hotkey P, we can see that the three objects we selected with the circular marquee are still selected. So now I'm just going to dirtily select all the objects in my scene and select unlink to remove any hierarchies that are in place. I'm also going to change my selection marquee back to rectangular. So now we already know how to select and link, we're going to create a hierarchy chain by selecting and linking along the row. So select and link click and drag, click and drag, and so on. Now we have a more complex hierarchy with multiple parent-child relationships, with the blue box serving a role as the root. Any changes applied to the blue box will work their way down the chain. So if we are to rotate the blue box, it will affect all the children beneath it. Similarly, the blue box affects all the children beneath that, and the pink box, same again. If we were to unlink the center box, this would break the hierarchy and the objects would behave in a very different fashion. And this concludes the introduction to 3D Studio Max tutorial. Thank you for watching.